here. Well, welcome you guys. We are so glad y'all are here. Um, I'm Emily Russell and I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development here at Clearview. And one of the things that we love to do on a monthly basis is host lunch and learns for our community to come in. They're free for anybody to come and participate in and we feed you a really great lunch. Um, and you learn something while you're at it too. You know, in this changing world that we live in, a lot of times we don't take time to stop and learn what's changing about our bodies and our healthcare system and how to navigate all of that. So I love when, you know, you guys come and spend an hour with us, take an hour out of your lives to learn a little something. And, and hopefully you leave here with a healthier mindset um, and, and with some skills that you can implement to make yourself healthier as well. So today we are so excited to have with us Dr. Robin Pettigrew. Um, Dr. Pettigrew has actually been practicing in the area for about three years, and prior to that, she has been a hospitalist, so she was mainly working inpatient, um, but her calling is really outpatient, I think, in building those relationships with patients. Um, she's an internal medicine physician, um, so she treats mostly adults with a variety of different complications and issues going on and health concerns that they may have. Um, and her office is here on our campus in the medical office building just next door upstairs in suite 220. 220, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking for a primary care provider, she is an excellent one. Um, and she's gonna be talking to us today about hypertension. Anybody in here have hypertension? Anybody? Nobody, right? Nobody. <laughs> so I know that you will find it very informative and be sure and ask lots of questions. And this is your opportunity to learn a little something today. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Pettigrew. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. I appreciate you coming out on this rainy day. I know the weather is going to be very hopeful. I hope for some sunshine, but hopefully with a little something in front of you to eat, it'll make it sunny in here. Um, just wanted to talk to you about uh, hypertension. I think that when I was uh, contemplating what topic to discuss, I thought, well, you know what? I saw more hypertension uh, over the last week as, as well as yesterday, where I honestly saw just about every patient that had an elevated blood pressure. And so I said, you know what, I picked the right topic because we're now going into um, a season where we're dealing with a lot of polypharmacy, um, a lot of over-the-counter medications will be chosen for a lot of upper respiratory symptoms. And I think that when you have underlying hypertension, we've got to be mindful that when you're on medication and you're trying to maintain a great blood pressure, we've got to be mindful of other medications that we select. So I wanted to refresh everyone. I don't know if everyone here has a little mild hypertension or hypertension which is causing you to be on several medications but I thought this would be a good topic to discuss. Okay. So when we talk about hypertension we first need to find out what is it that we're measuring. Okay and so we're measuring the blood pressure which is really the measure of the force of blood going through the wall of the blood vessels. And so a lot of patients will come in and say now what do these numbers mean? You know my top number, my bottom number and I'll kind of break it down and say, well, we've got a systolic blood pressure, which certainly is the top number. And the top number is the blood pressure that's going through the arteries at the time that the heart is contracting. And so this is now uh, pumping blood throughout the body. And so that number is very important to us because certainly it is a indicator of a lot of uh, heart disease that we find later on when that blood pressure is not controlled. We also have the diastolic blood pressure, which is the bottom number. And this number measures the pressure in between heartbeats. As the heart is relaxing, it gives us a reading as well. And so when we talk about um, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is important, just as important as the diastolic blood pressure, but the main thing is maintaining it so that you don't have hypertension, which is an elevated blood pressure. And usually the number that we give patients in our clinic, as we say, 140 over 90. We're trying to maintain a blood pressure under 140 over 90. And so while 140 over 90 is a, a marker, it may be that your blood pressure could run 130s over 80s, and that may be your norm. You may have a perfect blood pressure that's 120 over 80, and we'll also take that too. But when it comes to an, a range, patients like a range. And so while we always maintain less than 140 over 90, we're going to talk about the different parameters because certainly you're at higher risk for different problems with your heart, um, stroke, and other risk factors for other um, medical problems too if the blood pressure is not well maintained. And we like to catch it early. So I'm going to go to the next slide here. So there are two types of hypertension. Majority of patients have primary hypertension. So we have about 
80 million patients, people who have hypertension, <coughs> and about 40 of them have uncontrolled hyper, 40 million have uncontrolled hypertension. And so when we talk about essential hypertension, we really don't know the, the cause of essential hypertension. Um, certainly patients don't necessarily have to have symptoms when you have um, essential hypertension. You may go into the doctor's office and say, you know what, my blood pressure's running a little high, I've been feeling fine, I don't have a headache, I don't have any problems with my vision, I'm doing okay, and so we usually say that that's essential hypertension. There are other causes, though, for secondary hypertension where there are other known problems, such as um, kidney or liver disease, um, there's obesity, uh, sleep apnea has contributed to hypertension. We also have adrenal gland tumors. We have other medications. So these are factors that not only do we like to discuss, but we like to also screen for them too. Because of course, hypertension is also known as the silent killer. You don't have to have any symptoms, and yet it can cause havoc and cause problems later on that we can try to detect now. So that's why I like patients to come in with the notebooks, with blood pressure readings so that we can take a look and see how your readings are looking so that if they're running high, we can address and try to find the cause early, okay? So we have the primary and secondary, and remember, majority of patients are primary. This right here is uh, through the American Heart Association, and this is just a, a nice guide so that you kind of understand what hypertension is, where your blood pressures are falling. So when you actually do your readings, we have low blood pressure, where sometimes the blood pressure, that systolic, or that top number is less than 90. And the diastolic number, or the bottom number, is less than 60. That usually is a great marker for us because a lot of patients will have symptoms when the blood pressure is low. And I do have a slide so that when you're doing your logs at home and when you're looking at your blood pressure, sometimes it can explain a lot. Dizziness, <coughs> lightheadedness, <coughs> fatigue, depression, constipation. There are a lot of other symptoms that suggest that there's something going on with the blood pressure. So let's say, for example, if you're on medication for blood pressure and your blood pressure is running too low, sometimes just having a low blood pressure will indicate that we need to adjust those medications or look into other causes if, as to why you're having those symptoms. Now, normal blood pressure, um, we usually say 120 over 80. That was always the magic number. And so while a normal blood pressure is ideal when you're younger, as you get older, that may not be the norm, okay? And so we kind of give you a little bit of a window, and so there's a prehypertensive window where the systolic blood pressure is about 120 <coughs> to 139, and your, uh, your diastolic number is between 80 and 89, and that prehypertension is where we like to catch patients so we can monitor and review risk factors, make sure that we're doing everything that we can to prevent the blood pressure from going up and also prevent any other uh, risk factors that we may see with your blood work, such as cholesterol, such as diabetes, other risk factors that we can tackle early before we end up in the stage one and stage two um, categories of high blood pressure. So stage one is usually that 140 over 90s range. That's not a number that we actually like. And so when patients are not really symptomatic, this still gives us a window to do everything that we can to get the blood pressures down. So maybe decreasing your sodium intake, increasing your daily exercise, um, being mindful of maybe your weight and maybe trying to tackle that and seeing how we can you know, maybe lessen some of the, the calories, increase your physical activity to get some of the pounds off. That certainly does help. If you have a, a risk of sleep apnea, if we haven't treated that, that certainly can contribute to um, hypertension. And so there are other things that we can screen for while we're in that stage one category. Now the stage two is when you're running 160 over 100s. And usually I will find a lot of patients will say, I just don't feel well. I may have some fatigue, a little mild headache, but not all the time. So we don't want you to be alarmed if your blood pressure is that high, but we want you to be mindful that if it's running high and you're not symptomatic, we <coughs> have to rely on it. A lot of times I will tell patients, you know, your blood pressures are running high and while you feel well, sometimes your body's adjusting to the fact that that blood pressure has been running high for a long period of time. And so you might have had a window where you were 130s over 80s and then 140s over 90s and then all of a sudden, you're now in that stage two category. And so we need to make sure we tackle this blood pressure. So the reason why we're so uh, concerned about stage one and stage two is we don't want it to end up to become the <coughs> seek emergency care category where we're in a hypertensive crisis. And that's one thing that I used to find when I was a hospitalist. Now as a hospitalist, my job was to take care of patients in the hospital. And a lot of times I would have to admit patients because their blood pressure 
is just too elevated and they're having symptoms. And so, I'll come back to this slide in just a moment. So in a hypertensive crisis, you have <laughs> hypertensive urgency. So this is where your blood pressure peaks. It's 180s over 100s. Sometimes you may not have any symptoms at all. Uh, certainly it's not anything to be concerned about immediately. We always tell patients, if your blood pressure is running high, recheck that blood pressure. If there's something that's going on, if you just ate, let's say you had a, a, a high sodium meal, let's say you sat down and had some crackers and pretzels and life was wonderful and you, uh, all of a sudden that blood pressure is running a little bit high, sometimes it can be related to something that you just ate. Um, so recheck it again. Give yourself a little time to calm down. If you were just stressed, if you got a phone call and that kind of got you a little flustered, sometimes that can cause your blood pressure to spike. But if you're running high in this category, this is a time where we need to immediately address it so that it uh, doesn't turn into a hypertensive emergency. Now with hypertensive urgencies, there's no end organ damage. So you may not have any symptoms of headache or chest pain or nosebleeds or anxiety or palpitations. But if you do have those symptoms, that's the time where you want to go and talk to the doctor and say, you know what, my blood pressures are running in this range here. I do have a few symptoms, but they're not all the time. They don't stay up this high, but when they do, I can tell my blood pressure is up. This is the time that we need to address it. Sometimes it may be that you might be on medications that could be <coughs> causing your blood pressure to go up, or you could be on medications that may not be strong enough to keep the blood pressure controlled, okay? A hypertensive emergency is where I would come in as a hospitalist because then I need to put you into the hospital not only to get your blood pressure down, but also to address end organ damage. So I've met many patients who have had a heart attack, who have angina, who have elevated uh, cardiac enzymes, which will tell us that there is a heart attack that is evolving. Um, I've had patients who've had strokes that have been this high when their blood pressure is well over 180 over 120. Um, loss of consciousness, if your blood pressure is running that high, or maybe if someone close to you, their blood pressure is running 200 so over 120, and they're not lucid, maybe they're a little confused, that's the time that you want to go ahead and get them um, into the emergency room for immediate attention. We don't want them to have a stroke. Also, too, um, memory loss. If you've been running that high and all of a sudden your memory is not as sharp as it used to be, sometimes you can have um, mini strokes. Sometimes you can have change in your mental status where that blood pressure is starting to affect you. We don't want it to evolve into a stroke. We need to address that soon. Kidney damage, um, heart disease, pulmonary edema is one that I just found in the office just last week. Um, a patient came in, could not breathe, um, swelling, uh, shortness of breath just when she even eats. And so I listened to her lungs, they were full of fluid. Her blood pressure had been running about 200s over 100s. And she said, well, it hasn't been that bad. Actually, that's a lot better than where we were. And so at this point, um, I had to put her into the hospital because she was in what we call congestive heart failure. Her oxygen levels were quite low. She came back to see me, and um, blood pressures are doing much better, but really was a matter of putting her on a proper medication regimen. And so we like to catch it before it gets to pulmonary edema where your lungs fill with fluid, okay? We lose our signal. Yeah, I'll pull the cup though. Okay. So also too, the slide before that I will show you is low blood pressure. I have um, met several patients that have been on medications where let's say for a period of time your blood pressure was running high, but now you've lost let's say 20 pounds and you have been eating a lot better. You're not eating out as much. You're preparing food at home. You're aware of all the ingredients that are going in and you're on medication that's causing your blood pressure to go too low. Sometimes when your blood pressure is too low, it can be an indication that something else is going on, such as an infection. We've had plenty of patients who have had a urinary tract infection or you know they've been spiking temperatures and their blood pressure is dropping. And so you might have lightheadedness, you may have dizziness, uh, fatigue, but then if you're running low consistently and you're on blood pressure medication, a lot of times patients will say, do I take my medication if my blood pressure is running low? What's the window? If you have symptoms, you don't take it right away. You probably go ahead and call the doctor and say, this is what my pressure is. We'll screen and see if you have any other symptoms. But a lot of times we have a lot of low blood pressure because you might be taking too much of the medication or we need to adjust it and back off of it some more. I've met a few patients and I know that, um, I'm not sure if you were aware of the polypharmacy talk that was given um, for about several weeks ago, but sometimes you're just on maybe too many blood pressure medications. And so to me, it's better to maybe try one and then kind of work with that dose, try another one, because the realistic expectation is that you might need 
two medications, but you might not need three or four, okay? And sometimes too much of a good thing is a bad thing. We don't want the blood pressures to bottom out either. Um, one other important thing too, when it comes to a low blood pressure, I find that a lot of my patients as they get older, being on a number of blood pressure medications, and sometimes just one, you will get something called orthostatic hypotension, where you're sitting down or you're laying down, and when you stand up, your blood pressure will drop, okay? And a lot of times it will cause you to feel like you're going to pass out. Uh, you can have dizziness, lightheadedness, sometimes even blurry vision. And so I advise patients, one, check your blood pressure every time that happens because that sometimes is an indication that maybe we need to adjust the medications a little bit too. Maybe you've taken a handful of your medications in the morning time, the blood pressure has dropped, and about noon time you go to stand up, and the blood pressure is now 85 over 50. So maybe we need to back off some of the morning meds, so that's something that we need to, to look into. So this right here is just a, a diagram talking about some of the symptoms of a low blood pressure. So dizziness, headache, sometimes blurry vision, paleness, sometimes <coughs> a little sweaty. Um, also, too, an irregular heartbeat. Some people say, oh, I feel my heart's skipping a beat a little bit. And then sometimes, too, a little diarrhea and um, vomiting can occur as well. Shortness of breath we see not only with a low blood pressure, but we see it also with a high blood pressure, okay? So really the take home message is kind of be aware of symptoms too. I always, I guess maybe it's from the hospital, anytime somebody would call me with a symptom, I would say, well, what's the patient's blood pressure? Because the blood pressure can truly tell you a lot, okay? Now, we talked about the hypertensive crises. The take home message is that if your blood pressure is running 180 over 110 or higher and you have symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, back pain, numbness, confusion, difficulty speaking, changes in vision, that's an emergency. That needs to be addressed right away, okay? Right. And we just, uh, I, like I said, hypertension is called the silent killer for a reason. Now, sometimes what happens is we uh, do everything we can. We do um, the best with our physical activity. We're putting in our exercise during the week. We're watching what we eat. We're trying not to add any extra salt. We don't eat out. We're doing everything. I'm taking my medication, but my blood pressure is still running up. And I really don't want to go on medication. So what can I do? Or I don't want to have another medication. Sometimes it's just not your fault, okay? I tell patients we are just we're scoring with the genetics sometimes. You know, the genes are strong, and unfortunately with other um, disease processes such as diabetes, such as cholesterol, sometimes it truly is a genetic cause. But as you get older, the blood pressure has a tendency to, to run high, okay? And that's just our unfortunate reality, and that's why we are so diligent about screening. That's where we run into trouble with a lot of other medications. Uh, we have to be careful what we get over the counter because it can affect your blood pressure. So anytime you're contemplating a medication, over the counter for anything upper respiratory, for anything GI, just call the doctor's office and say, can I take this with blood pressure? Or even ask the pharmacist, can I take this medication? And they'll kind of guide you one way because that's one way that we can try to avoid any problems or spikes. Family history, of course, is, is quite strong if your parents had hypertension and your grandparents had hypertension, even heart disease, there is a strong chance that you will also have it as well. Or you might have it, or you have high risk factors for it, so certainly you have to keep that in mind. Um, gender. Um, certainly, um, as you get older, uh, males have a tendency to have a very high blood pressure when they're younger, but women have a higher blood pressure and certainly are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease too as they get older. Um, race, um, African Americans have been known to have a high prevalence of hypertension. Um, sometimes, certainly, genetics plays a role, but also to just diet changes too. Just not maybe being able to get the adequate um, access and as well as medications as well. Um, oh, being overweight, being over obese, uh, being obese is certainly a, a risk factor too for um, hypertension. Um, smoking, which we all know, we always screen for smoking and say, you know, that's one risk factor that we can control, smoking as well as alcohol. Um, while patients will say, well, you know, alcohol relaxes me, so why would it affect my blood pressure? While it does relax you, though, it can increase your blood pressure, so you should always kind of be mindful of that, and if you have a little cocktail, you may want to limit it to just a couple of times a week and not, um, it's always in moderation, okay? Um, certainly other risk factors too. We all know about high cholesterol and diabetes because those also increase your risk for heart disease, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far? No? Okay. Okay, so resistant hypertension. So we put you on a medication. We usually like to start with a, a 
the water pill if you're able to tolerate one. And that helps to draw out the fluid, the water, as well as the excess sodium that's in our bodies. But then what happens when it just doesn't work? And then we need to do another medication. And so you have something called resistant hypertension where maybe you really will need one or two or sometimes three medications to get the blood pressure down. I always like to walk patients stepwise. I don't like taking medication. I can barely remember to take my multivitamin. And I realize that many patients take medications for diabetes and for cholesterol, and honestly, one more pill does make a difference. I do get that. Um, I have patients who have come in and they have a bag full of medications, and I work pretty hard to try to take away those that are not needed. Maybe to have just a higher dose of two medications instead of a lower dose of multiple medications, just to make it easier because Compliance is an issue. Sometimes taking medications multiple times throughout the day is a full-time job. Okay, so I, we try to uh, be sensitive to that, but then there are times where if it's just resistant, we need the medications, and so we'll try to try a few different medications until we find the right one for you. Um, of course, you know, the realistic expectation is you might need a few, and it may take a while, so don't get discouraged, okay? Okay, sometimes when it's resistant, it lets us know some of the other conditions that we talked about, like sleep apnea, or if maybe I didn't know you were having a cocktail or two every night, some other things that we need to screen for so that I can see if there's any other reason why the blood pressure is running high, okay? Um, let's see here. There's something called metabolic syndrome, and the reason that I um, wanted to mention metabolic syndrome is because I have lots of patients now who have metabolic syndrome. And so when I was in the hospital setting, um, I did not see as many, but now that I'm seeing outpatient, uh, multiple patients on an outpatient basis, is something that needs to be addressed. So metabolic syndrome is when you have three or more of the following. So you have abdominal obesity, where your abdomen is quite big. Your triglycerides, which is a part of your cholesterol panel, this is your fast doors here, that's really high. It's above 150. We like it to be less than 150. And your HDL, that's your good cholesterol. Usually, if it's less than 40 in a man and less than 50 in a woman, that's a cause for concern, too, with metabolic syndrome. And systolic blood pressure over 130, diastolic blood pressure over 85, and a fasting glucose of 100, which sometimes can put you at high risk for diabetes. If you have three or more of those, then we go ahead and say, well, maybe there's a metabolic syndrome, and it helps us to treat your, not only your hypertension, but your other medical problems a little more aggressively. So if the sugars are running high, we may screen for diabetes. We may go ahead and say, you know, let's see what your A1C looks like. Let's see what your cholesterol levels look like. Because with metabolic syndrome, you can certainly have risk for heart attack and stroke, and so it helps us to screen a little bit earlier. So each, every three to six months or so, it's okay to have that blood work done. Um, just to make sure that those numbers are not creeping up. Sometimes you can be on medications which can contribute to kidney disease. Sometimes you can be on medications that contribute to liver disease. And so we know that kidney and liver disease can cause you to have elevated blood pressures, okay? So let's talk about monitoring your blood pressure. How many people in here have a blood pressure machine at home? Wonderful. And so I try to push for patients to log their blood pressure. You know, when you come into the office, we're wearing a jacket because we like jackets in medicine. And honestly, there's something called white coat hypertension where you go into the doctor's <laughs> office right. and you get nervous and you say, you know what, I just don't want to be here. How long am I going to have to wait? Oh my goodness, I hope the doctor doesn't tell me anything bad. I don't want another medication. Oh, did I turn my car off? And so by this time, you're flustered. And by the time you get in to see me, well, hello, how are you doing? And oh, your blood pressure is up. And you know what? Sometimes it very well could be that you're just in this setting and the stress of being in this setting and sitting across from a doctor causes the blood pressure to creep up. Very common. Um, I had a patient just before I came over, blood pressures always look great. And then I said, well, you know, I'm going to run over to the hospital. I have a talk to do. And he said, oh, come back this afternoon. And I think, honestly, in that window, his blood pressure must have shot up because it was very high when, by the time we sat down. So I said, I'm not holding it again. She goes, please don't give me medication. I said, no, 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 no meds. But if you track your own blood pressure at home, it helps us as a doctor, or as a provider, because we have one reading to go on. And sometimes you truly do have white coat hypertension. Or let's say you go to the doctor and it just makes you nervous to be there. You don't know what is going to happen at the time of the visit. You don't know if you know the diagnosis or the symptoms that you have have worsened. And so therefore, checking your blood pressure, keeping a log, and bringing that in is like 
wonderful. It's like a Christmas gift every time a patient is sitting across from me because that way I will know if your blood pressures have truly been running well or maybe a little bit on the high side or maybe we're reaching to the point where you know what, I'm running 180s over 100s or 170s over 90s, but I feel great. But that's still a window for us to go ahead and adjust it. So if you have a notebook and you run your blood pressures down as well as your heart rate and bring it in, it's a wonderful thing to a doctor because that helps us to fairly adjust your medications, okay? And in fact, it has helped me to take some patients off of medications because I had patients who were running too low or their heart rate is running too low and I said, you know what? You're on a beta blocker, but that's really causing your heart rate to go down. Maybe that's causing the lightheadedness and the dizziness and other symptoms certainly too. And uh, we, we try to adjust it. So bring your log. I, I think it's a wonderful thing to have a room full of patients with a blood pressure monitor. And so a few other things too, if you're deciding whether or not the monitor is accurate, I always tell patients to just take it, bring it with you to your appointment. And so that way when she checks your blood pressure, we'll check it with yours too, to be sure that your blood pressure machine is accurate. You know, I have had patients say, well, here are my readings. I don't know if the machine is really working. I don't know. I changed the batteries. It conked out on us. It fell off the table. So if you're concerned about your monitor, just bring it in. Okay, you can always bring it with you when you go to the pharmacy. And that way they can check your blood pressure too. Always ask if the machine has been accurate. And then you can compare the two readings as well. Okay, make sure the cuff fits. And make sure when you check your blood pressure, you're in a good position. Because I will tell you, if your bladder is full, your blood pressure will be higher. So when you go to the doctor's office, if you by chance may need a urine, let us know and we'll go ahead and get the <coughs> urine sample maybe early. That way, when you're there, your bladder, you're not holding your urine and your feet are flat on the floor. Make sure your arm is um, on a table on a flat surface because all of these make a big difference. Make sure that you're not talking and make sure you, it's not right after you eat, unless you're just curious as if you're, to see if your blood sugar, I'm sorry, your blood pressure is running up after that meal, that high sodium meal that you may have just eaten, okay? This is just a little uh, position of how to sit. I have blood pressure trackers that we give to the patients just to see if they need to write it down. Some people like to have a little book or a little notebook. I love uh, the tracker guides for blood sugars and blood pressures because then we can go ahead and make a copy and put it right into your chart so that we can always compare when you come back to see if we've been hitting our target goals with blood pressure monitors. So if you do it in a little steno notebook or on a blood pressure uh, tracking guide, it helps. Also, if your blood pressure is running high, write down your symptom. If you have a headache, check your blood pressure. If you have dizziness, check your blood pressure. Blurry vision, fatigue, just not feeling well, nauseated. My legs are starting to swell, check your blood pressure chest pain, palpitations, you feel your heart fluttering a little bit, check your blood pressure and then write down your symptoms because that helps me to determine whether or not you're symptomatic from the blood pressure being so high. And we are okay if you say, you know what, I'm just a little nervous, I checked it three times yesterday, that's okay too. If you check it in the morning time before you take your medication, if you check it at noon time, it's all right. If you just want to have a range, um, so I, here's the morning, here's the afternoon, here's before bedtime. My son came over with his new girlfriend. Check your blood pressure. Let's just make sure it's not fluctuating for other reasons, okay? So managing your prescriptions. One thing that I really encourage patients to do is bring your medications to your appointments because there is nothing like having multiple doctors prescribe medications for you. We run into a lot of trouble and I tell you, I have called multiple pharmacies over the last couple of months just to see what the medication list looks like. Because sometimes what happens is you may see your cardiologist in a couple of months and he may change one of your medications and then you might go to your pulmonologist and they put you on a new medication or you may see your primary doctor, your rheumatologist and he put you on an anti-inflammatory for the arthritis is getting just horrible to, to even bear. But arthritis medication certainly can contribute to blood pressure. You come and see me and I'm thinking, oh, you're doing so well. Wow, that blood pressure is high. Are you still taking what I gave you? But then not aware that you may have seen a couple of other doctors who prescribe medications that are contributing to your blood pressure. So I encourage you, wherever you go, bring all of your medication bottles with you. Because one thing about it is the pharmacy doesn't know what medications we start and stop. If this didn't work for you, I change it and I send it to the pharmacy. So the pharmacy may assume that you're taking everything. And sometimes I assume that you're just taking on what I have had you on from the last visit. Meanwhile, your medications may have changed. And sometimes what may be working for your arthritis may be causing your blood pressure to go through the roof. And so I like to kind of go through and, and review medications. It's only fair to you. 
A lot of polypharmacy, especially with blood pressure medications, can save your life, can certainly help us to prevent from having any other symptoms later on. If the blood pressure is getting worse, we don't know why, and meanwhile you've been on a medication that I had no idea. So bring everything in, even if it's a bag, even if it's a box, we'll go through it, we put on the list and we update it, okay? Now, always take your blood pressure medication at the same time every day. I had one patient who honestly was taking his blood pressure every other day. And I asked why, he said, well, you know what? Um, I've always done it like this, it's always worked, but sometimes what always works is not consistent. There are a lot of blood pressure medications where if you don't take it, your blood pressure will spike. And so you may have symptoms, but then the next day you take it and your blood pressure is down. So same time every day is what we usually tell patients, okay? And if you're not tolerating the medication, I always tell patients your medicine shouldn't make you sick. Don't be afraid to tell your doctor or your provider that I just don't like this medication. It may be causing me to have um, headaches or lightheadedness. It causes me to feel like I'm nauseated. It's causing me to have symptoms of erectile dysfunction. Let us know so we can change it. There are so many other medications that we can choose to make it work for you. Everyone's regimen is different, okay? All right. And then of course I have here, keep your appointment with your provider. Don't skip your appointments. Try to go in and have your regular checkup so that we can see your meds, make sure you're doing well, and then adjust as we need it, okay? And also be cautious with over-the-counter medications. So how do we prevent and treat hypertension? Some ways that we can prevent it is eating healthy, and of course if we eat at the hospital, we're eating healthy, right? And so reducing your salt intake. I tell patients low sodium diet, 2,000 milligrams a day. If you can do 2,000 milligrams or less, that's a good range. You'd be surprised at how many milligrams of sodium are in canned foods, are in processed foods, those foods that are just simple. You know, you may not want to cook for a whole household, so you go to the freezer, you take out a lean cuisine and, oh, not that I should have said a brand, but you take out a dish and you put it in the microwave and maybe it's loaded with a little bit more sodium that you're supposed to have and you, maybe you had something that went into the microwave, a little breakfast biscuit, sometimes they may be a little high in sodium. You may have already reached your allotment for the day. So turn over every label and look at the milligrams and see if you're going over that 2,000 milligrams. Sometimes it makes a big difference. You know, less sodium, or I tell patients, where sodium is, fluid follows. And so if you've gone and you've had a wonderful barbecue dinner, or you've gone to Journey's End or the Blue Willow, and oh, I went back to the buffet only three times, wonderful, the next morning, you can't get your rings off or your feet are swollen, and maybe it was a little bit too much sodium. <laughs> so always make sure that you kind of be mindful of what you're eating too at home, okay? I always tell patients when you prepare it, you know what's in there, okay? Um, avoiding stress. If you can, or managing stress. We can't avoid stress, but we can try to manage it a little bit better because the reality is while there's no direct correlation with hypertension, it can affect your blood pressure, okay? Um, pain as well, too. I did put pain up here, but I find that um, when patients are in pain, the blood pressure runs high, so that's something else that we need to address as well, too, okay? Um, avoiding tobacco smoke or even secondhand as well as actually smoking contributes to hypertension. Activity, if you can move, you don't have to join a gym. You don't have to go on a treadmill every day, but if you can just walk, or if you can maybe do some you know, exercises while seated, you'd be surprised there's plenty of exercises you can do sitting in a chair. I learned that. And so, therefore, regular activity can certainly contribute to lowering your blood pressure, okay? Um, compliance with your medication, taking your medications, maybe even getting like a little pill container so you don't forget to take your blood pressure medication makes a big difference. I had one patient, she said, you know what, I forgot to take it in the morning, so I just didn't take it. And by the evening time, her voice was quite slurred. Her speech was slurred because her blood pressure was too high. And so if you forget to take it, take it right away or call and say, do I take it? Do I take half? What should I do? Okay, but try to take it at the same time. Okay. Some lifestyle changes that we can do. So certainly restricting the salt. Okay, uh, moderating your uh, alcohol consumption. I'm not going to say not to drink. But certainly we need to be mindful that when you're on medications, such as cholesterol medications, we've got to mind, be mindful of the liver, okay? And so you just got to be careful as to um, if you like a little bit of a cocktail, maybe modifying it just a couple of times a week um, if you're on other medications, or at least let the doctor know so that we can continue to monitor your liver function test, okay? Um, weight reduction and management and maintenance, and then also a high consumption, if you can, of fruits and vegetables and low-fat foods, okay? Does anybody have any questions for me? I have one. Yes. Um, do you recommend taking 
blood pressure medicine in the evening instead of in the morning? So you know what, that's a really good question because there are a lot of medications which sometimes can cause you to be very tired. Um, for example, there is a medication called clonidine. I find a lot of patients will say, after I take the clonidine, I'm just wiped out. And so sometimes you can take certain medications in the evening time. A lot of medications are um, for 24-hour coverage, and so it's okay to do that, but also monitor your blood pressure during the day. Because sometimes when you're up and about, let's say if you have arthritis in your knees and you're moving around and you've got a lot of pain, well, at nighttime you may not be in as much pain, and so therefore the blood pressures run down, run low. But in the, in the daytime when you're up and about, if they're running a little bit high, then your medication may need to be modified. But yes, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, we always prefer in the morning time you're you're up and about, um, you're eating, and certainly certain medications are twice state medications where you have to take one in the morning and one in the evening. But uh, there are some that do cause fatigue, and you can take it in the evening, but that's no problem. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there? The blood pressure machine you mentioned, uh, the one I have is the one you do the wrist. On the wrist. Is that as well, or are the yeah. others better? I will be honest. I have try the one on the wrist. I had one patient who was logging the pressure and then I let her take home a blood pressure monitor. I said for every time you check on the wrist, check on the opposite arm on the brachial just to see. And brachial certainly is the brachial um, cuff that we do that makes sure it fits comfortably because the tighter the cuff, the higher the pressure could be. And it, it, there were a few points off. It may not be as accurate, but what I'd like you to do is if you can, when you do the cuff, always make sure that you bring it in. Well, I did that when I first bought one. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. I took it in, and it was, it was as accurate with the with the home with the office yeah. machine, and that's fine as long as it's accurate. And I'm not saying that all of them are not, and certainly even some of the um, brachial cuffs too. Depending on you know if it's not a validated cuff, certainly it can run a little bit. It can give you a range that's not accurate. But so as long as you bring it, you have to be very careful to like make your feet flat on the floor and. Uh, this one you put your hand near your chest, oh, near, your, near heart. your heart. Does it give your heart rate too? Yeah, it okay, does. Good. It gives the whole reading and it keeps a memory. That's the neat thing about it is it does keep a memory. As it's long as you know how to work that memory, I've been uh, struggling in the oh. office sometimes with trying to get the memory up, but yeah, <laughs> well, that's great though. Yeah, because I can look back and I can tell, you know, where, it, it, if it spikes or anything like that, but I've been using one of the wrist is just easier for me. Right, no, it is It is easier. And as long as you can bring it in and we make sure that it matches um, the blood pressure relatively closely, then it's a reliable wrist monitor, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Was lunch good? Um, Hopefully low sodium, I presume. A question not related to that, yes. but are you familiar with the medicine amatizol? I am. Uh, you got any comments? Well, um, I've had a few patients on it. Usually, um, we're giving it to for um, for constipation. Yeah. Um, it's a great medication. I honestly will tell you that I try to make sure that patients are doing everything that they can to prevent constipation before we get to the point where we have to prescribe amatiza. Oh. So I try to make sure that you're getting fiber. Whether or not you're eating fiber through oatmeal, through yogurt, through cereal, because now they make it so easy, you don't have to go find it and cook it. You can actually take a fiber uh, capsule, fiber gummy, you can drink Benafiber, Metamucil. You can also go ahead and get in a lot of water intake. I find a lot of patients aren't drinking a lot of water. Um, sometimes, too, flax oil. A teaspoon of flax oil is very helpful, too, um, to help lubricate the stool. A gastroenterologist taught me about that a long time ago. Um, there are medications too that cause constipation and so the reality is if you're doing all of those things and you still have it then we try you on a stepwise approach to um, getting you to the point where you need amatiza. There's other medications too that you can also do that may not be as expensive or may not be um, to the degree where you need to take that particular one. But it's a great medication and hopefully it's working for you. What about prune? Prune is a good uh, Ah, if you can tolerate prune juice, and you know what, I used to trick my children and give them chocolate juice. I would mix a little bit of apple juice with prune juice, kind of cuts the taste a little bit, and add a little water, and it works wonders. What in the I hospital just, we do that. Well, just eating prunes. Uh, you can eat prunes too. Now, as long as you're able to tolerate the juice, there are some patients that can't do a lot of juice just because if they have underlying 
um, problems with sugar. But if you can certainly do the juice, that's fine too. Apple and currant juice are fine. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, you said the blood pressure cuff should be comfortable. Sometimes when they check the blood pressure, it really kind of hurts. Is it supposed to do that? You know something, um, it, it, it is supposed to be snug. Now, if you find that it's too tight, if that's snug going on before they even um, inflate it, inflate the cuff, then sometimes you might say, you know what, can we just recheck it again? And sometimes we can go ahead and do it with a larger cuff because we have, uh, we've noticed that, of course, that the smaller the cuff, the higher the reading. Well, it's usually when they inflate it, but sometimes it will, like, I'm like, is it ever going to stop? <laughs> you know something, and sometimes what it's doing, it's reading at that higher systolic, and so sometimes it's an indication that your blood pressure may be running high. So it may squeeze to maybe 150, but then it's saying, oh, if it's higher than that, it'll squeeze a little bit tighter to get to maybe 180, 190. So sometimes it may be that you know, your uh, blood pressure is running a little bit on the higher side. Uh, but now would it show up in the reading when it wasn't done? It, if it's running high, yes. But then also, too, you can check it with a larger cup just to make sure and compare those readings, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just know sometimes it's like... It's too tight. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Over to I'm glad. I'm sorry that my slides didn't work as well for us, but you know, hopefully the information is still helpful. I can remind you guys with some little pamphlets about Dr. Pettigrew's practice, and it's got the phone number on there. So if you're in the market for a primary care provider, um, I'm sure she would love to help take care of you. Um, it's always important to have a primary care provider. Um, just like Dr. Pettigrew was talking about, you know, if you if one physician prescribes one medication and another one prescribes the other, the primary care provider can act as that gatekeeper, you know, that really keeps all of the information together in one place. So they kind of know who you're seeing for cardiology and what they've given you and who you're seeing for this, that, and the other. Um, so, so I definitely encourage you to get a primary care provider if you don't have one already. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your attention. Thank we just you. appreciate it. We always love an opportunity to have people in the hospital and, and feed you something good and teach you something new. So thank you all. And next month we will be hearing from our head radiologist. His name is Dr. Thomas Johnson. And he's going to be talking about bone health. So how to keep your bones strong. What are some symptoms of not having strong bones? Um, what does that look like on an x-ray? What are things like bursitis and tendonitis? And what, what does that kind of look like and mean for your body? So um, we would love to have you guys join us. That's going to be on Wednesday, December the 16th. So if you haven't signed up, please do. We'd love to have you. So thanks as always for coming. If there's ever anything we can do, let us know. We're here for you. Hey, I'm Isaac with Reboot Computer Company, and we're going to give you the Reboot Tech Tip today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Wi-Fi networks. Um, you know, you can go to Best Buy or Walmart or whatever and get these crazy uh, Wi-Fi routers that look like spiders if you turn them upside down. They got all these antennas and all kind of craziness. Um, you know, those things look cool and, um, you know, they do a lot of cool stuff. But uh, a lot of times when people go and buy those things, they think that that's going to give you better range. So like you put it in your house and you're like, oh yeah, it'll cover my house and the next door neighbors and all this stuff. And um, it's just not the case. Uh, the Wi-Fi signal has a hard time going through walls and you may get through a wall or two um, and then, or you know, a floor, maybe two, maybe, um, you know, but it, that's about the extent of your range that you're gonna get. Um, so like we have a customer that went out and bought one and uh, just didn't cover his whole house and he was upset. And, um, so what you can do if you have a big house or if you have a big business, um, you know, there's a couple things you can do. You know, obviously the best answer is to run uh, cable everywhere. That's always quickest. Um, you know, uh, it's just quicker than wireless. It works better. It's more secure. Um, all that stuff. So if you can run cable, you know, that's the best idea, especially for businesses and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you can't run cable um, and you still need to have Wi-Fi all over the place, you can do what's called Wi-Fi extenders or Wi-Fi uh, repeaters. Um, and basically what you do is you install your router and then you install this Wi-Fi extender and um, it hooks up to the, basically to the signal coming from the router. 
um, and then it rebroadcasts it. And so if you have that little box in another room, um, it'll rebroadcast in that room, um, and it may cover another couple rooms or you know another floor or something like that, um, and that'll help you out. Um, but again, the best thing to do is always to run cable. Um, you know, I think most houses though these days don't have places where you can run cable, so Wi-Fi is definitely the answer. Um, but anyway, so don't go out and buy that $300 router. Um, you can get you like a regular one for 60 bucks or whatever, and maybe a repeater for 20 or 30 bucks, um, and that'll help you out. Um, that's it for today. I'm Isaac Rhodes, giving you the Reboot Tech Tip. Hello, Walton County. This is Kevin Little with uh, Chairman's Report on Channel 16, Walton Entertainment. Happy New Year. It's January 2016. Uh, we finally went from the 70s and 80s of December to the 20s and 30s of January. So uh, we hope we're going to have a few months of winter here. We just completed uh, last couple of weeks, we had close to 14 inches of rain in different areas of the county. Actually, most of the areas in Walton County had somewhere between 10 to 14 inches of rainwater and uh, a lot of roads uh, were, were pipes were carrying it to the capacity and even some had water across it and a lot of people that have moved in over the last several years realized that, that the, their area in their yard, their low spots caught a lot of water and, and water may even stood and got under your house and so uh, it's one of those situations where you know our pipes were acting like they were supposed to moving the water across and uh, it did did uh, we only lost Hestertown Road which is on the southeast end of the county down between Union Chapel and Ebenezer uh, that that don't really know what caused that pipe to fail but it did and it, it blowed the road out down there uh, South Cross Lane and North Cross Lane up near Bowl Springs uh, and uh, Providence Club, those two roads generally do go under if we have a, a major storm event or rain because they're still dirt roads and one of them runs right along the Appalachian River and the other one is over at the beginning of the Alcove River and so uh, those, those areas there just have never been really upgraded because of it being a dirt road and still, still there. But, um, and, uh, all in all, our road crew's done very well to keep the people traveling. We uh, we monitored them 24 hours as we were going into the holidays there, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and even uh, around New Year's Eve there, we were still having a good bit of rain here. And so I uh, want to commend our public works crews that uh, worked throughout the night and, and worked and, to keep you traveling and keep you going here in the county. Uh, and, uh, and as I speak on the rains, I, I anticipate some snow or ice or something like that coming in January or February. And so keep monitoring uh, the local TV, local Facebook sites. We'll be updating you what's going on there if uh, we do have any kind of closings or anything out like that. Because, uh, you know, it's January, February generally here in Georgia, and it, it is probably some of the coldest times that we have. And we, we will. Uh, update you if we have any snow or ice. Uh, going on to the construction scene, I was going to let you know it's after January 1st, the Charlotte Rival Boulevard, they should be starting sometime soon on that extra lane, which will be running westbound on the side of uh, 138 Charlotte Rival, running out into Martin Luther King Boulevard, out in front of Tractor Supply, and that'll be moving a lot of traffic on. Going to take about uh, three to three to five months to get that done, depending on how the weather is and how the traffic uh, if they can move the traffic through to be able to work and get that, that going on really well. Um, that, I think that will make a big difference on a lot of the volume moving from the 138 end uh, uh, off, off, off of 78 through that little intersection out there. But as you know, Moe's is opening there, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is opening. I hear there's going to be a firehouse, firehouse subs and even Burger King at the end of the Walmart parking lot. So. You know, there's going to continue to be delays, going to be continue to be a lot of cars in that area right there at 138 and 10 because there's just not enough, not enough area to move your cars. Uh, the city of Monroe and Walton County and Georgia DOT are evaluating to see what other uh, areas we can improve right there to try to move people through, try to signal out, do timing on the signals to try to help you. So just don't get frustrated. It's uh, it's. Uh, just some volumes deal there. I, I come through Loganville on Monday this week and on uh, 78 coming from Snellville, I had to set through three traffic signals right in downtown Loganville just to get through. So 
you know, that's one of the things that a lot of people come in, we, we're going to have some growing pains, and that's some of them, but we, we are, be mindful that we are working on that and looking at what we can do to, to make things go forward. And uh, on another note, I want to talk a little bit about Hard Lever Creek, Hard Lever Creek Reservoir, as I've showed you pictures of, it's on the south end of the county, down uh, right out from Social Circle. That reservoir is, uh, we got, caught, a, caught a good break on all the rain from the good Lord, and we are somewhere around uh, 700 acres, 750 acres underwater. You know, that's a 1,300 uh, plus acre reservoir, maybe even close to 1,500 time you get all the outer edges there. And so we've got a lot of water in there. Matter of fact, it rose in the last week of December uh, close to six feet. and. Uh, we're at the point where we can only raise it one foot a week, so we're talking with EPA right now, seeing what we need to do. We are letting the water out uh, as fast as it can go out, but we also are, the boat ramp is under construction down there, so we got a lot of things that we wasn't anticipating this large amount of water. But way back when this, this site was chosen, back in the 90s, it was the largest drainage basin for a reservoir that they were looking at. And so uh, this kind of proves it now, you know, everybody was saying that the little creeks, the little streams, that they would never fill up. But I mean, if you hadn't had a chance on Soul Circle Fair Play, make sure you ride down and look at it because uh, it's it's filling up. But we have we've come a small portion right now. The 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 rest of the reservoir now is going to really be volume because there won't be any. It'll be all water. There won't be any valleys and things like that to fill in. So, uh, but it is history in Walton County and you need to go and take a look at it and see what's coming on. We'll have plenty of drinking water for many years to come and it's just going to be something to have nice here in the county. Uh, that's about all I got for this week. If you have any questions or concerns, give me a call at 770-267-1301. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. April Mitchell and I'm one of the veterinarians at the Monroe Vet Clinic. And today I'd like to talk about the importance of having your dog's teeth and cat's teeth checked yearly. Dental disease is a huge problem that we see in both our feline and canine patients and it can be a really painful problem and a lot of people do notice the smell of their pet's breath. They can have really bad halitosis when they have dental disease but oftentimes it's hard to really get a good look at your pet's teeth and so it is very important to have a dental exam performed at least yearly. Um, there can be all kinds of bacteria and particles that can get up under the gum line. When we do dental cleanings here, one of the main things we see, which is kind of disgusting, is hair. They can have hair, their own hair, packed up under the gums that can cause a severe gingivitis and inflammatory response. Left untreated, the gums will continue to deteriorate their integrity and cause pockets, and these pockets can lead to all kinds of infection, actual tooth decay, and root exposure, which root exposure can then lead to you know, loose teeth and tooth abscesses and things like that. So prevention is the, definitely the key, just like in your own teeth, going to the dentist is very important, brushing your teeth every day multiple times is very important. I'm kind of a tooth fanatic. I've never had a cavity and I'm terrified every time that I'm gonna go that I will have one. Um, but in our dogs and cats, it's not always so easy to brush their teeth. Some dogs are very willing to allow that to happen and that's great if you can do that. Cats are not big fans of that. So it's really important to have a veterinarian you know, check those teeth and make sure they're healthy. As cats and dogs age, the risk of dental disease does increase. So if you um, have questions or if you would ever like to have a you know, dental exam done, please you know, feel free to contact a veterinarian because they would be glad to set something up with you. Um, February in um, our area is dental month, so we do offer free dental exams um, and a, um, you know, special things towards you know, having a dental cleaning done on your pet. In dogs and cats, you can't just do a professional dental cleaning without them being under anesthesia. So anesthesia is part of that process. So it's, it is really important to have your animals monitored and have their teeth cleaned you know, before you have an emergency tooth abscess because it is really painful. People that have had a toothache before can understand how painful that could be. So imagine you have six teeth in your mouth that are all hurting like that. 
and dogs and cats oftentimes don't stop you know eating I always have people say well they're eating great well they are eating great they're probably just swallowing the food and not even trying to chew anymore so please um, take advantage of dental month and have your pet examined and let's see what we can do thank you Hey there, thanks for tuning in today. As always, we're going to show you some of the dogs and cats that are available for adoption here at Walton County Animal Control. You know, we had a really warm December, but it looks like that cold weather is finally in on us and probably going to stay for a little while. So you need to think about your pets during this cold weather. You know, maybe you have a, a dog that's chained out in the yard. Go ahead and start bringing them in the house for the winter. Uh, we do have local ordinances that you cannot tether or chain up your dog uh, during weather advisories. And last year, unfortunately, we had to give out several tickets. Neighbors would see their dogs out during those ice storms, take some photos, and we would come out the next day and issue a ticket. We'd rather not give the tickets, so just do what's right and bring your dog indoors. Uh, if your animals are outside, make sure that you've got warm shelter uh, with bedding inside. It's best to use uh, straw or hay inside. If you put blankets in the dog house, they can get wet and then freeze and it's not really helping the dog out at all. But the best place is just bring the dog inside the house during this cold weather. Don't forget about your pets. Ice buckets will freeze, water bowls will freeze, uh, so make sure you check out that they have fresh food and water at all times too. Just think about your pet. If it's too cold outside for you, it's probably too cold outside for them, so bring them in the house where it's warm. Maybe you don't have a dog or cat and you want to add one in 2016, you can come to our shelter and see what we have available. We're going to show you some of those now, or you can window shop at waltonpets.net. Here we have a Cocker Spaniel. It's a male. He's already neutered. He's believed to be between seven to nine years old. Um, he was picked up in the Loganville area. Just looking for a good home. Uh, we have a male. Um, he is a lab mix, but he is brindle. Um, he's probably about a year or two and he's already neutered. Um, gets along with other dogs. Very sweet. Um, he does have some hair missing on his back, but we think it's probably either from the diet or possibly allergic to fleas. Uh, he needs a home fast. Uh, this is Cassie. She's a Border Collie mix. She's approximately three years old. Um, she's already spayed. She's a very friendly girl and she would make some, someone a great pet. She just needs someone to love her and give her a good home. Uh, this is King. He's a Chihuahua mix. <laughs> Probably about four years old. He's a really sweet little guy. He's got oh, <laughs> lots of energy as you can tell and he just needs someone to give him a good home. Where do you come alive? A stadium, lecture hall, a music hall, church potluck? This year, you have a new spot, walkgeorgia.org, a free website that provides you with all the resources needed to get your heart rate up and body out in your community. Sign up and receive individual or group fitness tracking, fitness demos by certified trainers, recipes, and a guide to resources in your Georgia county, all in one easy to use site. When you move more, you live more. WalkGeorgia.org What's the worst that can happen? Converting your VHS, CBHS, 8mm, and Mini DV to DVD. 
Preserve your family's video history for the generations to come. Creative Artists, 1113 West Spring Street, Monroe, 770-267-7368.